Hey everybody, um, I wanted to kick off my journey into Old Hammer series, which will go on over time and then eventually end up into bat reps for Rogue Trader uh, initially, um, with a In Defense of Metal video. Now, recently um, on the uh, Warhammer Weekly, I believe, uh, question of the week, there there was in the last couple of months a, um, you know, what do you like better, plastic or metal miniatures? and you know, for the folks, the, the vast majority of the folks that play GW style games, um, it, it appears that, you know, from the response and the amount of comments and, and support of that question, that the majority of folks prefer plastic miniatures. Now, that's a generalization. Um, it, it, it's an observation I've made. Just, you know, it, it sort of includes just YouTube commenters and and, and folks. Um, and so it's not necessarily a representation of everyone, and it's definitely not a representation of all age group of gamers and things like that. It's not to say that people don't like metal. Um, but I thought, given that, I talk a little bit. It seems that it's a bit more of an uphill battle to try to... Um, uh, convey the the sort of value and how um, cool metal miniatures can also be. I don't really plan on setting out to change anybody's mind today. That's not my intent at all. And I will put a link to a video that I did quite some time ago where I went through my... It's a long-winded video, so only watch it if you're really interested in the subject. Uh, but it's just my opinions and a number of... On more of a technical... Like, from what I believe on a technical level, the differences between metal plastic and resin miniatures are and positives and negatives and from watching that video you'll find out that I like all three mediums and would be very vastly dis very disappointed if any of them went away I, I kinda like to have the option of all three having said that I have a strong appreciation of metal miniatures and I wanted to talk today a bit more about some of the subjective um, qualitative aspects to what I believe the value of metal miniatures are. And so I'll just briefly talk about it today. I'll do my best to be brief and just kind of show you a couple observations as I'm collecting now a lot of old metal miniatures from when I was a kid, seeing them again in some cases, or in some cases really just collecting them for the first time, um, but just really having a strong appreciation for them in comparison in some respects to the metal and resin miniatures that I currently also buy. Now, what I'll, I guess um, to start off, I am going to start with a little bit of a practical note here. And now, I've picked up some Eldar miniatures, and here we have a single cast early Guardian. Okay? Now, I believe this miniature's cleaned up amazing. These were all caked with paint. Okay? They all were painted completely. And I've stripped them I've moved from just using like what they call a purple power type of detergent solvent, uh, I would describe it as, to using both on metal miniatures that purple power as well as an acetone bath afterwards um, to try to best clean it all up. But really when I see this, um, I see a miniature that is roughly 1987-1988 and it's um, age, how long it's been around. That's a long time. And for all intents and purposes, I get now the same feeling handling it and getting ready to paint it as I would a new metal miniature. Um, and I just, you know, it's got a nice heft to it, which a lot of people describe when they talk about metal miniatures. And it's just really, it feels valuable to me, which is subjective, but it's just the fact that this was around in 1987. And I get to appreciate this and utilize it in 2016 going on 2017 so just about 30 years later, as if it was yesterday in my opinion. So, so as well, I've got a miniature from the same time period, which also cleaned up really well. But it just, and if you can look, this is really from the same design period, like the helmet's the same. Um, this is also an, an early miniature, but it was the first ones that had plastic arms. If you'll notice, the plastic arms aren't on it. In order to strip it, they did need to come off. But I think it's very fair when talking about materials and their value over time and sustainability to draw a direct comparison to a model that was multi-part. It actually had plastic at the time and it had metal at the time. Now, this is essentially the plastic piece 
that came with it. Now, the hose is actually broken, and I don't think that wasn't from the stripping. It actually came that way. Um, but I believe it's just a, the fact that it's a fragile piece and plastic doesn't really hold up well, you know, to damage. Um, when stripping it, I had, let's say, 10 of these, um, and many of them came apart in many different ways. By trying to use the brush on them, um, I had to be really careful, and so I didn't go heavy, because in some cases I did break the fingers, um, just because it's so fragile. They broke off, and in some cases the glue is still there. In other cases, um, it's just going to be really hard to get this primer off without actually um, completely ruining it. So I took it easier than I normally do on a plastic model. Um, in all fairness, these are Eldar Guardians, and so they're, they're a bit more fragile than, than some plastic models. But the thing I'm trying to convey here, I could run these through some baths some more, and I could continue to work at it. But there were some that were broken. Um, it is a bit more of a difficult process, and it's... I don't really care what anybody says, it's never going to actually get back to this state with the with the plastic, the arms, and the attachments, and all the pieces. Um, so, or this state that it came on. And so, right off the bat, it makes me want to just get single cast miniatures from that time, um, not with components. Just, this was a bit of a mistake getting these, in my opinion. It's great in that I can still use the arms and I can still use them. Um, they're not bad miniatures at all. I really do like the, the majority of the body, but it, I would much rather have single cast minis uh, of that time period for more than one reason, but that's one of them. Um, another comparison that I would just draw is I have the two wizards that I've kind of shown already on the channel, I believe, in uh, one point or another. And um, these are just from the Warhammer Fantasy range. Now, both of them are really nice models. I do like the designs on both of them. Um, this one here is a um, sort of a fixed piece, so it doesn't add a lot of personalization. Sort of similar to the metal miniature. It just comes as really to, to come in, in this piece. It kind of fits together. The arms don't move all around and things. But um, the interesting piece to me is that like this stuff is extremely flimsy. And so like from the perspective of... Um, what I was talking about just before, like I would expect that this one, I don't know when it went, what year it came from, but I expect that as long as I'm somewhat reasonable in my gameplay and take care of it, that in 20 years somebody, I could sell this to somebody and they'll get like the same level of enjoyment that I would today out of it. This one, particularly if they want to strip it again, um, very unlikely that it's going to stand the test of time. It's much um, more fragile. Um, the other thing too, just from a design aesthetic, now people can make miniatures to look with different materials pretty much however they want to look, um, you know, um, but it's just interesting like just looking at the um, proportions. Um, when you get into a discussion of I guess computer generated or a more systematic approach to sculpting uh, versus traditional sculpting, um, sometimes you do really see like a different personalized touch in the miniature. Now this guy is definitely more, um, I'm not going to say, say characterful, although I kind of want to say that, but I'd like to say his features are more exaggerated and there it does feel like a, um, a, a different kind of um, proportion in the way that it's done, whereas this one um, is much smaller than all the goblins of that time. Um, but it actually, it seems to have a much more uniform approach through the design. That kind of difference, in a lot of ways, I notice come up over and over when I see more recent miniatures and ones that utilize a more standardized approach to production to the old ones that were individually made. Um, I'll give like another example of that. I, I don't have um, the Rogue Trader Marines, but if you actually look at this box of Everybody's familiar with these guys, but if you look at like just this is an um, an open box of GW current Marines, they're fairly current. I, this this kit came out in the last 
two years. Um, that you can actually add a lot of um, individualized design elements with like heads and things. Um, so it's not as if like you're bound to having just one type. But when you look at the Marines overall and you look at the helmets, um, they all pretty much look the same. I mean, they're all in exactly the same proportion. The helmets, even with different paint jobs and maybe a slightly different doodad here and there, they, they pretty much look the same. You know, like they, they, they definitely look like they came out of the same design. Um, and for some folks, because these are soldiers and for some folks for what they want, that's a positive, it's not a negative. Um, they want that uniformity. But what I've found, and I'm going to throw up a picture here of some of the old Beaky first generation Rogue Trader um, miniatures. When I look at these miniatures, um, I don't even have the picture in front of me. I don't even know which one we're looking at right now. I'm going to pick one. Um, but I've looked at enough of them to know, um, to have the impression that I'm, that I'm going to state. And that is that each one has its own bit of flavor, even though they have standard kind of mark of armor type. Um, they all look very personalized. They were all individually sculpted. And you can really see that. And so at times that you can notice a lack of standardization. But in a lot of ways, for many people, it adds a charm and an appeal that um, you don't necessarily get when like every single one comes off the same exact design pattern, perhaps even the same computer generated specs um, for measurement. And so there's an appreciation for that, um, which is subjective and personalized. Not everyone would, would have that. But that is another advantage of the metal um, miniatures that were individually sculpted. In particular as well, I, like, I really like single cast, as I mentioned, miniatures. And part of it is, even though you're, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, when you have the ability to manipulate the model with arms, moving it around, you can argue that, yeah, you can like position the gun in different ways and it adds variety and gives options. Particularly options if you're looking at different gun types and things. And I understand that. But in some ways, from a design aesthetic, it almost feels a bit forced at times. When you have a fixed arm, like let's say, let's look at this miniature here. When you have a fixed arm that comes out like this and it always comes out like this, then no matter what you do, it always to a degree will look the same, even when you're looking at two different miniatures with it positioned differently. And in some ways, it can give an impression of an artificial feel. Now, when you look at um, another miniature I'll throw up, like one of the Beaky Marines, when you look at one of these designs, um, you really get an artistic appreciation for the way it was designed, and it's very personalized. And in some ways, you can't replicate it, like on a plastic mini. They could do a single cast plastic mini, don't get me wrong. I mean, like I said before, like every medium, you can attempt to do everything I'm talking about, but it if you get away from the standardization, in some ways it defeats the purpose of what they're trying to do from like a business perspective as well as a design efficiency perspective. What I was trying to say here, like I'm going to show two, I have two Orc Nobles from the original Rogue Trader line. When you look at this Orc Noble, there's two things that um, I feel are real strength to being a single cast um, individually sculpt miniature. Pretty much if you have lots of options in the way you're going to move, put your arms and glue your arms on and different types of weapons, you will never get the snug look of this orc looking over his gun like this. They'll have to make a multitude of options to do this and then you'll still just have a limited number of options. Um, and so really it's just the nature of the design piece and that an individually sculpted model you can get a, a much more personalized sort of look to now granted you're going to get in most cases only a limited number of the of those and that's true you know um, so but it is a strength to the individual um, casting process I believe the single casting process as well when you look at these different works these are of the same time period. Um, each one of them has its own sort of face and look, and it's because it was individually sculpted, and that's another thing that adds a level of charm to the single cast early 
individually sculpted miniatures that you just don't see today. It's really difficult. Um, it's not to say that they don't have great plastic miniatures now that actually have lots of charm in the way the face looks and the, exp and the expression, but particularly if you know it's something where it's supposed to be members of a unit, you it, you'll never really see that anymore as compared to um, you know maybe it'll be like an HQ compared to every single one of these single casts where you would still today see some expression that's sort of um, individualized and and has a lot of quite a bit of charm to it. In a lot of ways, um, I kind of when I think about metal miniatures and old hammer and I think about it compared to the technologies of today and recognizing the benefits that we see in resin and plastic models today it reminds me a bit of the classic car phenomena and I don't know how many of you folks watching are car folks that you know like old cars um, I'm not particularly a car guy although I come from a family of car <laughs> folks that actually I have a relative that has um, many of their cars on the front page of magazines and has is tremendously into old cars and so I'm not it's not a foreign subject to me um, the thing about the old car phenomena and particularly particularly I use a reference uh, my family member that I'm talking about is that just because you like old cars doesn't mean you don't recognize that the new cars today have better technology and have, you know, lots of advantages over the old cars. It, a lot of it is a design aesthetic that's appreciated. But there's a lot of similarities, too. Like, with old cars, you can restore them, in many cases, much easier than you can with the materials that cars are made out of today. So given in some degree it's the simplicity of the old car and the engine and, and, and certain aspects to being able to restore it not having computers inside them but I think it's safe to say that 50 years from now you're gonna have a lot harder time trying to perfectly restore your Toyota Camry than you would come like a Dodge, Dodge Charger or something like that and so that has an appeal and a value to the vehicle that could be considered subjective you know it just depends on what you value um, there are some individual aspects to the designs um, back then. I don't know that that crosses over completely, but you could make the argument that um, with the way cars are designed today, that there's some efficiencies in trying to, from a business perspective, keep your designs similar in some aspects across different lines and models. And where you might have seen a bit more variety in each model in the past, that one, I think, is maybe a little bit of a stretch, but I think worth maybe considering. But to a degree, I think it's um, it's an appreciation of the value of you know something from the past that that you can actually still have today that has a different type of character to it. And I don't know. I actually see a lot of commonalities between the old hammer um, movement and just classic cars and other things like that where people value that stuff from the past that offer different things and it still actually has value today in many respects. So um, I think that's mostly what I'd really like to say about it. I have lots of thoughts on the subject but I really think that um, to, you know the metal models you know going by the well I, I guess I would also say that there's a lot of metal model manufacturers today that are really doing an awesome job at um, casting and detail um, one of them that I would just mention is Corvus Belly which I think uh, you know that that makes infinity I think they're doing an amazing job I also think that the recent casts from night models are really quite amazing some of them you can you put together with cylinder fits and really tight awesome fittings and um, you know like just the casts are just really quite amazing and so not all metal models you know are reflective of the past and the single cast and the things that I'm showing here you know it has evolved but I think and there are some manufacturers that I have heard have said that they believe themselves that the metal is a better process for their miniatures than plastic in some cases you know, I think we just assume that all companies just have a trajectory, you know, based on the business need and variety of things that they're going to go down a certain line. Some of them are actually sticking with the metal models, and it's kind of interesting um, as to their choices and their reasons for that. Also, if you look at Rogue Trader in the very beginning, you know, towards the beginning, I mean, there were there was a need for plastic vehicle kits, and there, there are some very good arguments on how you're limited in size on your metal models, and, you know, this... Um, 
dreadnought that I've shown already in another video is quite heavy. You know, um, it's it's not a light a light model even at this size. Imagine if it was five times the size. It's just there's a certain level of practicality. But having said that, in our miniature games, the you know our perception of what is great, you know, and how big it is and how grandiose, you know, what it means to be bigger and why that's better, you know, on the table and, and that visual perception and what it does when you actually sort of start to make everything bigger to all the other models that are smaller than it and your perception of them is a whole nother subject that's going to actually be in, an, be in another video on Journey to Old Hammer that, that I'm doing. So I hope you guys enjoy this perspective. And like I said, um, this is called in defensive metal, and I think it's mainly because it's harder in many cases for some folks to see the value of the metal miniatures. And even how in 30 years how it could be considered a bad thing if there are no metal miniatures and really people can enjoy the nostalgia that they do today. People of generations after me that might get attached to a certain genre and really like when they're older to be able to um, collect something and from their youth and they just can't do that anymore. And so I hope that um, some of the points that I showed here gives just a different appreciation of why some of these metal miniatures are really awesome and why some people like them. And I hope that whichever miniatures that you do prefer that you enjoy them and get them painted up. Take care.